Welcome to another episode of Uncommon Entrepreneurs here today. I'm Drew. Brian Borgery. Luke Stokes. Yeah, and uh, we're excited. Uh, today's uh, video is sponsored by Donate PR. It's a, a p donation platform for 1101C3s in Puerto Rico, nonprofits. Check it out, link below. We're here at beautiful Coco House. Today, we're sitting here with Luke Stokes, good buddy who is uh, infamous in the crypto blockchain world. And I think you're gonna get a lot of relevant information today. He's the Managing Director of the Foundation for Inter-Wallet Oper Operability. He's passionate about volunteering Volunteer systems and government governance, and has been involved in Bitcoin since early 2013. He's been a, a consensus witness for Hi, which is now Steam Blockchain, since early 2018, and a custodian for EOS DAC, a community-owned EOS uh, IO block producer and DAC enabler. Uh, he's got a computer science degree from UPenn. Um, he's bootstrapped his previous company that was a shopping cart software company, Foxy Cart, which he'll get into. And he lives here currently in Puerto Rico with his wife and three kids and, uh, and so forth. So welcome. Appreciate you joining. Thanks for having me. One Appreciate clarification. Yeah. Steam broke off and had a hard fork into Hive, not Hive into Steam. Just in, as it. you're reading that. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> nerdy stuff. Maybe you don't know what we're talking about, but but it's important. <laughs> if you use social media, it might be interesting for you because it's social media on the blockchain. It is something I've been involved in since 2016. Pretty interesting to talk yeah. about. Yeah. So let's get more into your story. I mean, I read the overview, but we're, you know, fill, us in, fill in the blanks. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it was probably like senior year in high school that I first got into computers. My mm -hmm. dad built databases, and so I grew up around programming and software my mm -hmm. whole life, pretty much. And I started building websites around like 1996. Nice. And I was like, this is super cool. And I eventually went to college and uh, majored in computer science, just really had a lot of fun with it, started doing consulting. That was during the dot-com boom, so I experienced mm -hmm. all that. I had people that were like, leave your, leave your degree at Penn and come you know, work for us. So I got to see all that manic craziness. And to a degree, I'm seeing it again with blockchain and cryptocurrency. And from there, I uh, ended up uh, working for a couple different organizations, you know, building systems for them, intranets and things of that nature, and really had this entrepreneurial bug most of my life watching my dad you know, run his own company. And I started, you know, kind of through helping my friend. He was like, mm -hmm. hey, I, I'm sick of all these shopping cart companies. They're all terrible. 2005, 2006. And I was like, well, I can build you one over the weekend. How hard could it be? I've built shopping carts before. And of course, that weekend project turned into like 10 years. So, <laughs> so we started uh, building Foxy Cart, my, mm -hmm. my good friend and I. And I was doing it part time. So I'm a bootstrapper mm -hmm. at heart, kind of, you know, work my day job, come home, mm -hmm. you know, ha spend an hour and a half with my wife or so, and then go and work till one, two in the morning. And that was kind of standard. Did that day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Did that for about four years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd work a pretty hard Saturday as well, you know, put in 10 hours here and there. And, um, Grew that company to the point where my business partner was like, hey man, you know, you gotta quit your job. We gotta do this. We're hiring employees, we're making this happen. And so I probably stayed even longer than I needed to, which is not normally the entrepreneurial story of where they jump out too early and then they don't mm -hmm. know how to get paid bills. You know, we had savings, we had things prepared, and uh, and we took the leap. I guess that would be around uh, 2011. Yeah, it was 2011. Mm -hmm. Started doing that, uh, really loved it, grew the team, mm -hmm. remote, full remote team, not a large company, but you know, we processed over a billion dollars through our system. Um, integrated to about 2,000 plus stores that were using us, paying us monthly recurring revenue. And it basically was just a way to help businesses add e-commerce to their existing websites in a really easy way. And through that process in 2013, I started getting interested in Bitcoin because I'm already deep in the whole payment system, credit cards, acquires, merchant account, payment gateways. I just started seeing the whole financial system from central banking to you know how the governments and treasuries of the world do these things. And I was like, we gotta do something better and just caught the bug. Uh, I spent $50 in January 2013 and, and I got two and a half Bitcoin. So that was a pretty good purchase, about 20 bucks a piece at that time and today it's $11,000. So I, I was obviously very interested in this technology. And from there, I uh, really just dove into the community, started getting involved. I started a meetup in Nashville, Tennessee, where I lived mm. at the time. And at the same time, I was kind of confused and frustrated with like the lack of governance in that system. At the time, there was a lot of block size debates within the Bitcoin community. You know, are we going to take the technology this way? Or are we going to do it this way? And there was no on-chain mechanism, meaning there was no code-based way to come to consensus mm. on how they're going to evolve the technology. And we were mentioning Steam. I got involved in Steam at that time around 2016 because they had something called delegated proof of stake. It was one of their mechanisms for coming to consensus. Mm. And it involved the token holders having a direct say 
and how the protocol evolves and being able to vote for how the protocol evolves. I'm very excited about that and also about the usability uh, that they were demonstrating. Because mm -hmm. with FoxyCart, I think there's still a Bitcoin wiki entry for FoxyCart from 2013, trying to onboard people to pay with their shopping cart, you pay with crypto. You know, you click a couple things and you can onboard and your customers can pay and they're like, what's Bitcoin? <laughs> it's yeah. fake internet money? I don't get it. It's just creating confusion for my users and there's card abandonment and, you know, they, they, they have to go, they go off and research Bitcoin and forget, you know, that they were checking out, right? And yeah. so I, realized like, okay, we got to make crypto easier. Mm -hmm. So when I saw Steam, and it, which is now Hive, you know, seeing the community blogging and, and, and having human readable addresses yeah. for their crypto address, being able to send and receive crypto super easily. My wife finally getting on board blogging. She bought a camera lens actually, you know, for mm -hmm. money she made it, blogging on Steam at the time. So I get very excited about that. And then uh, a couple years later, uh, I kind of got recruited by the group of people that were helping launch the EOS blockchain. Mm -hmm. And EOS is also built by Dan Larimer, same guy who built BitShares and, and Steam. Uh, I know a lot of the news is talking about DeFi and all that right now. That was done back in 2016 with what Dan was building. Um, but I just, I, I liked the, the way he was building technology and onboarding people. So I got very excited about participating in EOS. And I got kind of recruited because I was became a block producer. They call them witnesses on the Steam blockchain. And a block producer is essentially just someone who, again, gets elected by the community to secure the network. And when we talk about blockchain, it's simply just a ledger. That's not a word people use often in their day-to-day -day lives, but it's essentially a way to keep track of credits and debits. And that's really what money has always been throughout history. So we look at blockchains are just ledgers, and you have to figure out, well, who gets to control the ledger? Who gets mm -hmm. to add an entry? Who gets to validate that the entry isn't uh, double spent? You know, when I send you a dollar bill, I slide it across the table. It's pretty clear that, you know, that's yours now. But if it's a digital dollar bill, how do you know I didn't send it to Brian right before I sent it to Drew, right? And so this technology enables these ledgers to work effectively. Mm. And I just got really excited about technology and uh, started working with EOS quite a bit with this one team called the EOS DAC. And they're building something called Decentralized Autonomous Communities. Mm. It's a way to do business differently and build communities differently. So I'm very, very passionate about that. I worked with them for a couple of years. And then eventually in 2018, sold my business back to my business partner so I could focus full time on cryptocurrency consulting and advising. And then through that, uh, ended up meeting the team that is behind the first version of the FIO protocol, Foundation for Interwallet Operability, making cryptocurrency easier. Mm -hmm. We'll get into all that, I'm sure. But yeah. that is my uh, overview. And somewhere within all that, I uh, moved here to beautiful Puerto Rico with my wife and three kids. Uh, they're uh, 11, 9, and 7 at this point. And uh, I've always worked from home you know, as of you know, building FoxyCart. But it's been uh, even more interesting with all the COVID and everything else going on. Like, yeah. like everyone's living like we live, you know, homeschooling and working from home and all that. So it's normal for you, yeah. what everyone's going through right now. Yeah. So you got it down pat. Probably didn't change much besides less grocery store visits. Yeah, literally not much at all. I haven't seen you since February, <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah, not much has changed. Other than, I, you know, I do miss the local community here. We've got a great community with Crypto Mondays and all the work that Pedro's done to get that community together. And you guys are doing great work for Uncommon Entrepreneurs. I've really enjoyed those events when I've been able to come out to them. So I do miss the community a bit. But other yeah. than that, uh, yeah, same old, same old, building awesome stuff. And I've been more busy than normal with this, you know, being a managing director for a global nonprofit mm -hmm. with people all over the world getting sure. involved. It's uh, been super exciting and really uh, amazing how much growth I've had in the last, you know, nine months or so. It's been great. Yeah. Interesting. So what, uh, you said somewhere in there you ended up moving to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Why did you decide Puerto Rico? And tell us a little more about that. So the, I'll, I'll get a little controversial on this answer sure. in okay. that uh, as I started looking at where the future was going, you know, again, I've been studying central banking and the financial system of the world. I've been studying governance as I look at cryptocurrencies or blockchains are essentially mechanisms for governance. And I started to get really frustrated with the nation states of the world. Uh, if you want to research topic, go go research democide. You know, there's 260 million people that have been killed because of government. So I'm not a fan of that. I think we can do better. <laughs> and so as I started researching this, I started thinking like, I'm not really a fan of what, you know, the government is doing my government, the United States government uh, around the world and different mm -hmm. places. So I was getting more and more concerned with this. And I got to the point where I was, a lot of my friends are expats and they've kind of renounced citizenship and gone other, lived in other countries where they feel they have more freedom and more autonomy and more ability to not, uh, not only control their own destiny, but not have their finances used for things mm -hmm. they morally disagree with, mm -hmm. such as, you know, bombing children on the other side of the planet. Right. And so when I approached my wife about this, she's just like, no, we're not going to like, 
renounce citizenship and go to some country that we've never been at before. Uh, I'm not going to have my relatives have to get visas to come visit us. Just yeah. not an option. So I was yeah. like, ah, shoot. All right. Well, I can't renounce citizenship and go live in, you know, we, we had visited Costa Rica and, you know, we travel a lot as a family. So mm -hmm. we, you know, I was kind of looking at different ideas, Peru, Belize, you know, where could I go? And then my good friend, Sean King, mm -hmm. uh, he, he was spent a lot of time out here and he messaged me a while back and said, hey, we're moving to Puerto Rico. You should come. And I remember to this day, I replied to him and said, yes. <laughs> and I was just like, it was just, yes. I didn't know enough about it, but I was like, yes, Puerto Rico, let's do it. And he taught me all about Act 2022 mm -hmm. and specifically how it's beneficial for cryptocurrency people like myself because mm -hmm. you don't have the capital gains concerns. And it, it fit with my idea mm -hmm. and my ideals of I don't want to support this military industrial complex. So I get to withhold some of that from that entity. And at the same time, the taxes I do pay will be more localized for mm -hmm. the people in Puerto Rico. So I, I like that. I like the idea of being able to inject money into this community through the services that I'm offering to people yeah. outside of this community. So I, 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 we came to visit for a while. My wife was like, all right, maybe. And, you know, I'll check it out. And so we came to visit. I spent a couple weeks here. had an amazing time. She got to wander through the aisles of the Walmarts and the, uh, you know, the, <laughs> to make sure that, like, okay, Costco has all the same things I expect yeah. at pretty much the same prices. Okay. Yeah. And um, and really, like Sean and I and Sean's wife Cindy, we just tag teamed to like convince her on it. Yeah. So we we uh, we did that. It was actually we were planning to come um, at one point, but then the hurricane came through, so we had yep. to push it to the next year. And we came, uh, enjoyed actually the uh, the crypto event they had here. I think it was I think that was twenty. Was it the, in March of twenty eighteen? Yes. They had the three in a row. We were was, all yeah, there. That was the first we week, and I was we yeah, in all, Puerto Rico. We were all yeah. That was, that was, that yeah. was when we our yeah. family started moving here from our company because we yeah. had come a few months before that. But yeah, yeah. Shout out to Coin Agenda. Yeah, they, <laughs> they brought the Michael Turpin and others bringing that all together. I remember the night before I was going to get on the flight, my friend VG was like, "Virtual growth." It's like, "Hey, can you speak at one of these events?" So I actually got up on stage at one of the events and gave yeah. a little thing. Um, but yeah, that was an amazing week, two weeks for us. And then. Yeah. Kind of just my wife being detail oriented did this whole pros and cons spreadsheet. She had it yeah. all worked out. Like here's the benefits, here's the challenges. She had it all yeah. worked out, well, and then the finally she's thing. like, "All right, well if we're gonna do it, we should do it within the tax year. So let's do it by <laughs> December." And I was like, "All right." So we came back. I think it was September. We came mm -hmm. back for a bit. You know, traveled around the island, and she got to kind of try a, a bunch of different places. And so we're in Caguas. Who really likes kind of that. Uh, suburban feel, mm -hmm. you know, uh, localized neighborhoods and stuff. She doesn't really like living in the city, doesn't want to be in the rural area. And that's one thing that's great about Puerto Rico is any type of area you want to live in, you can find yeah. in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so yeah, we, we started renting and we've been renting for actually like a year and a half and we always wanted to buy, but in the neighborhood we were at, it's kind of a little bit of an older neighborhood. It's been around for about 25 years. We didn't see as many kids around yeah. and that was the biggest downside you know, as a, as a family of five that my kids weren't playing outside every day. Yeah. So I'm really excited to say that just in the past, gosh, it's been like maybe a month now, yeah. we, we actually bought uh, here in, 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 in Caguas in Puerto Rico about 10 minutes away uh, in uh, Los Prados. And there's kids out all the time, like the very first day, you know, and there's kids from their karate class they already know. Mm -hmm. So that was like a really big uh, win for us. We're pretty excited about. Got it. So yeah, we're, we're, permanent residence with our own home now. It feels Got good. It. Feels awesome, good. man. Cool. So I want to dive into a couple of things. You brought up DAX, which I'm super interested in and dabble in. Uh, and then we can jump into FIO a little bit more. But let's let's just, if you want to give a, a brief overview of, of DAX, many times you'll hear DAO or DAC, Decentralized Autonomous Community or Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Um, you just come on and dive into that on a high level and then maybe uh, what excites you about it? Sure. Yeah, definitely. I, I, you know, so it's funny, even just the way I'm listening to the book called uh, Exponential Organizations. I've read like, you know, A Year Without Pants. I've read, uh, you know, The Starfish and the Spider. Like I'm always kind of interested in organizational structures that allow for rapid exponential growth. And also, as I've said, I don't like corruption. <laughs> I don't like violence. I don't like these, you know, manipulations of human motivational systems that harm people. And so when I look at what is a DAC, I look at it as a group of people with a shared goal. It's a group of people coming together. So it's very similar to a co-op. It's very similar. It's not a new concept. It's just using technology, new technology in a new way mm -hmm. to accomplish shared goals. And so at, the, at a base level, when I look at a DAC, decentralized just means no single point of failure. There's a, there's a system in place that if one thing goes away, the system continues. Yeah. Autonomous doesn't mean like AI and robots doing everything. I more look at it as 
predictable, reproducible results where mm -hmm. you have what's called smart contracts. You have basically code running on this ledger we were talking about earlier, and that code is auditable, it's transparent, mm -hmm. and it's immutable, meaning you can't go and change it without a consensus of the community. So you don't have, for example, you know, some Enron books in the back room, you know, cooking it so that you so know, everything's you, transparent. Everything's yeah. transparent. And it's not only transparent, but it's reproducible, meaning mm -hmm. like a function. I put in this information, I get this output every time. There's yeah. never going to be a time where I put in this information and I exactly yeah. and I don't get a reliable, different reliable. There's no reliable. black box yeah. that it's going through that maybe a government or some other organization an Enron has and then it spits out a different answer. Yeah. Yeah. So this seeing corruption throughout the financial industry, seeing how you know they front run things and all these different things, like I like these transparent models that are actually owned and operated by the people adding value. And that's the, the other part that you see for EOS DAC, we talk about it as community. For FIO, uh, we talk about it as consortia. It's a group of industry leaders that come together with this shared goal to make crypto easier for everybody. And so in that model, it's exciting in that like the pieces that make up a DAC are pretty pretty straightforward. You have often uh, smart contracts, like we talked about, uh, something called multi-signature permissions. So you have a group of people, you know, Brian couldn't just today go, hey guys, I want to spend all the money on this, you know, crazy idea I have. That's like my brother's, you know, <laughs> car dealership or something, right? <laughs> you actually have to come to consensus within mm -hmm. the often elected custodians of that organization. And those custodians are have some threshold. Maybe if there's like 12 custodians, they have to get nine approvals out of those 12 before those funds on chain would actually transfer to support that project. And then as far as the projects, that's done through what we call worker proposals. So anyone in the community that uh, registers to be a member of the DAC, signs the constitution, says, yeah, I, I agree to these kind of shared ideals, uh, can submit a proposal to say, hey, I'd like to add value to all of us in this way, and I'd like to get compensated for this amount. And ideally, and, you know, some of these systems are still being worked on, but and we've got some of it uh, coming together where I could say, okay, if you get agreement on that proposal, the funds to pay you get moved to an escrow account, and you actually, as part of that proposal, submit who the arbitrator is going to mm. be so that if there's any conflict, I mean, how much of the legal system is responding after the fact? Yeah. You know, there's, yeah. there's yeah. crime, there's, there's, there's fraud, there's something terrible happened, and then we have to go punish somebody. Yeah. We yeah. throw them in a cage or we do whatever, and that's just silly if you have technology to prevent the crime in the first place, prevent the fraud in the first place. And so we could take those funds, put them in escrow, have the arbitrator there, and then if the person comes back and says, okay, I worked on this, here's my first milestone, I did the work, I'd like to get paid now. Well, let's say that person's a fraudster scam artist and he ghosted us all and he didn't do anything. And he still wants to run that function on the chain to claim his money. Well, the board can be like, no, we disagree. And the arbitrator can step in and say, I agree, you're being taken advantage of. You would lose your position as board members. You would get unvoted by the token holders if you allowed this payment to go through. So we're going to re refund the DAC. And vice versa, let's say a worker comes in, does phenomenal work, mm -hmm. and somebody comes in and you know elects a whole bunch of new board members who are like, we want to take the entire DAC a different direction. Like, okay, but you had a commitment to this worker and they did the work. You still have to pay them. That's a requirement. Mm -hmm. So even though you want to go a different direction, you still have to honor this payment. And if they're like, no, nope, we're going different directions. Those were diff different board directors, different people. We don't have to honor that. The arbitrator, again, can step in and say, the work was done according to spec. We're going to release the funds. So uh, I like that these type of things can avoid the legal system that we're normally bothered and burdened with as entrepreneurs. And at the same time, you have to work well, well with it. You know, There are a lot of details of DAX and DAOs that aren't super clear as far as yeah. the legal structures today. And that's changing, like Wyoming and other different states are coming up with cool ideas. I think there's an amazing opportunity for Puerto Rico to lead in this way, yep. to create legal frameworks, sandboxes for people to explore DAX and DAOs. Because right now they're similar to an association. So you have like joint and several liability mm -hmm. concerns and other mechanisms like that. But I do believe this is the future because if you can imagine a company that's centrally controlled mm -hmm. and they have to you know, have different departments and give people different roles and responsibilities, they can only move so fast. But if you incentivize 10,000 people with a shared goal and they have a clear incentive for adding value to that ecosystem, which one's going to move faster? You know, yeah. 10,000 people going a bunch of different directions, coming up with crazy ideas, implementing them, you know, executing on them, having people agree. Uh, so it's, it's really exciting to see how disruptive that model is going to be. And I do think that, uh, you know, especially with people working from home and everybody thinking about how can I get a side gig, yeah. a DAC and DAO model lets you participate in multiple communities at the same time. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that I think is awesome, and and I love trying to contribute where I can to that sort of thing. What I've come across, I don't know if I shared this with you, but a few months ago I came across 
even the a lawyer he's in San Francisco, although he's going to come down and visit Puerto Rico. Nice. He created a legal wrapper for for DAOs or DAX. Um, so you're not creating an entity at that point, but there are some points of, of liability and things that you can address even without an entity. And you put it on GitHub, um, and you can just have this wrapper for general type, I guess, decentralized autonomous organizations or, or communities. And, and just seeing stuff like that, and finally seeing some people in the legal world, which mm -hmm. is very old school and structured, and they do the same thing. You have thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of lawyers around the world who are doing the exact same job, just in their own silo, and repeating the same exact work. And yeah, they'll automate some and not pass along any of the savings to you. They still charge you an insane amount, but they're, you have thousands of people doing the exact same thing that don't have to at all. Yeah, AI is going to disrupt and, that field significantly. Yeah, <laughs> and, and seeing that there's actually some lawyers trying to take charge of that and be like, hey, we should open source all this mundane crap and we should be paid for being creative thinkers to solve these problems Absolutely. within the law instead of, let me see how much I can bill you and, and whatever. So I'm, I'm happy to see at least some people starting to get like that and seeing lawyers that are also coders, which normally isn't the case. Most of the time you have a very smart a developer, coder, engineer, and very rarely are they good at other sides of it, whether it's the business or the marketing or, or something else. And that's why we end up with a lot of projects, especially in cryptocurrency, where they're just not user friendly. And honestly, they, they suck to use, even if the functionality under the hood is amazing mm -hmm. and world changing. If no one's going to understand it when they look at it, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, I'm, we're starting to see things coming together. And I see decentralized autonomous communities, organizations, as something to bridge that because you have a community working all at the same level and not just one CEO per se who's just dictating who's getting hired and in charge of stuff, but you're like, you have these legal people, you have these, these engineers, software developers, and then you have just regular people saying, hey, that sounds cool, but it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and a marketing person said, this is how you solve that. And you have that. I mean, that's why crowdfunding has been growing over mm -hmm. the years. That's I have a background in that. And, and the crowd is super powerful. Um, no one knows every one thing themselves, but you if you have the structures so it doesn't become like mob rule yeah. or something like that, because that is an issue, um, especially if emotions or whatever. And oh, yeah. In the political climate we're in right now, yes. I mean, we see that as well. Like someone tweets something, it could be 100% false, but they see it real quick and all of a sudden they start a movement and you have millions of people like mad at each other and hating off of something that's false as well, because there's no like control or mechanism in it. And even worse, you have social media companies that make their money off of that type of engagement oh, the fuel that are now just making more money and, and, <laughs> and enabling the bad things. <laughs> so, like. so one of the things that's interesting, and I should say, um, you know, there's no perfect solutions. You know, I, I don't, I don't market a DAC or a DAO, and some do. Some are so passionate about this, you know, that are like, this is the you're gonna change everything, and I think it will. But it's not the silver bullet that solves all problems. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that with the caveat to be like. If you've got good people, that's what matters. Yeah. Any structure that you put in place with good people will probably do all right. Any structure you put in place with bad actors, fraudulent people trying to gain the system, extract wealth instead of creating value, you will have problems. And yep. so what's nice about a DAC model is you can hopefully find those people quicker yes. and actually have a mechanism to not involve them. So uh, as an example, uh, one of the times with EOS DAC, we had a community member who was spreading FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it got a little political in that there was like a Korean community that was voting a certain way and an mm -hmm. English-speaking community was voting a certain way. And they voted him in because he represented their community because of his language and everything else. But he wasn't really a great actor for the network. And eventually it got to the point where it was so bad that we voted. There's an on-chain mechanism. If 10 of 12 custodians agree, you can remove a custodian, literally fire them. And we were able to do that. It was like removing a board member. And because it's all transparent and on chain and everything, mm -hmm. it was a really great moment to recognize like, oh, wow, we can do that. You know, when someone's going against consensus and causing damage yeah. to the network, we can actually respond to that. So that was very cool. And I, I part of what we're doing with the OSAC is try to make that interface easier. And what I'm doing as the managing director with FIO is try to use that technology for how we manage FIO. Mm -hmm. Because the foundation for inner wallet operability is not meant to be like some central entity that's just like dictating how we're gonna make crypto easier. 
we've got a protocol that we've developed, but at the same time, we want to work with everyone. We want all the exchanges, all the wallets to be part of this community and mm -hmm. contributing ideas on how the protocol is going to evolve over time, how we prioritize, you know, and, and anyone again in the community come submit a worker proposal and say, hey, I think FIO should do this. I think it should do that. I'd like to integrate it in this product or this service. You know, I'd like to be you know, compensated for that effort or the value I'm creating for the community. So we, it's, it's been uh, really exciting to bring the kind of these worlds of passions that I've had, you know, everything from e-commerce and, and the transactions. You know, I had my little, my little Bitcoin uh, COVID mask on and, and you're asking earlier, hey, where'd you get that? I was like, well, we actually have a demo store where you could check out from the e-commerce store using a FIO request. Mm -hmm. And so you say, I want to pay in Bitcoin. And it's like, okay, put in your FIO address and you hit submit. And it's like, you're done. Go check your wallet. And yeah. you pull out your wallet and it's like, hey, this store, here's the order ID number and all the, it's the exact amount. There's no public addresses, no big crazy hashes like you see with Bitcoin addresses. And it's just swipe my thumb and say, yeah. And that's it. And it shows up in the mail. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's neat to see like all these things I've been working on throughout my career come together. Yeah. From blockchain to governance to e-commerce to making crypto easier. Which that's, that's very interesting because you'd been working on Foxy Cart, which is then now this going to FIO. It sounds like there's a lot of overlap. So I appreciate you breaking down kind of the, the details behind a DAO and a DAC to give some perspective to those that maybe don't have the context. So it sounds like it's way more transparent, it's simpler, everybody's got a voice that's important, and you just kind of lead with what your skill is and people are compensating you for that. You're not having to, it's, it's can like spread around the world and with different languages to make things simpler. Where, where are we, are we like, is this in the present moment possible or is this a pie in the sky? Like where, I think a lot of people are at the moment, you know, not even familiar with, like they don't even have a Bitcoin address yet. But um, I think we all hold the belief it's gonna be like a light switch turns on and people are gonna be like, what just happened? But maybe give some context, you're in the field, you would know. That's a great question because it is a matter of like, adopting these exponentially growing technologies has different curves, right? Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, I was building websites in 96 where even then not everybody had email, right? Mm -hmm. Like even then CEOs are printing out emails right. from their secretary, yeah. come bring it to my desk, Tax. you know? Yeah, and yeah. so to me, I've kind of been there, done that to mm -hmm. see this exponential growth. And I, I like tracking, for example, the doublings of the, num of the percentage mm -hmm. of humans that are using this technology. And I hear from a friend of mine that we're at about 1%, the end of this year might be 2%, next year 4%. And 4% from what I've heard is close to what we saw in the dot-com bubble, which is really surprising. You'd think there was more than that, but it was a, you know not as many yeah. people as we think. And it was only after we kind of went through that craziness that you had the real big explosion of the internet usage. And so I think we're, you know, we're definitely a number of years out. How many years is hard to say, but what's cool is that this technology is available today. If you were to approach someone and say, I want to do a startup, mm -hmm. I want to build, you know, I want to build a startup. Yeah. My answer today would be, well, depending on the startup, why don't you instead build a community? Because yeah. that's where the value is. And this actually gets into kind of the philosophy of value, which I, I tend to get philosophical sometimes talking about these things, but the pieces of paper in your wallet right now yeah. that represent financial value. Yeah. It's pictures of the dead white people, right? Like, why are they valuable? Because a bunch of people believe they're valuable. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if that story breaks down, as it's done in Venezuela and Argentina and other places, then that value goes away. It's all about the belief. All value is belief. And in these situations, if you can create a group of people that believe in what you're doing is valuable, mm -hmm. that's the true value. And, and so we're talking about consensus algorithms. I mentioned delegated proof of stake. Bitcoin uses something called proof of work. There's all these mechanisms where how they secure the network. But what really is the security underneath that is something I call layer zero security. It's the number of people who actually believe what you're doing is valuable. And so I would mm -hmm. recommend entrepreneurs today to definitely take a look at this. You could check out EOS DAC. There's a lot uh, of, of building on Ethereum. There's other chains coming out like Cosmos, Polkadot, and other places. Uh, yeah. The DevDAO, which is something the Casper Labs group here. There's some people in Puerto Rico involved in that. You know, there's a lot of really interesting projects that are really focusing on devs the developer DAOs where we can build these structures for entrepreneurs. So it will be as easy as like, all right, I can set up my LLC and do a startup and raise funds, or I can go and create a DAO and a DAC, launch my own token potentially, you know, depending on how the laws in your area, whether it's going to be a security token or utility token, however you're going to do that, and actually get the community to participate. So then what's really beautiful about this, and if you're an entrepreneur listening, you've probably had this experience at least once in your uh, career where you're like, I want to build this, oh dang, as I dig into it, I need three other companies to support this. Mm -hmm. And that idea is you could launch these other companies as DAX or DAOs 
in a way that the community keeps them going and running them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can focus on your core competency. And you have this trusted, reliable source with a whole bunch of people around the world providing the service that you need in a way that everyone in adding value is incentivized. So it, it, it's early, definitely early. And I would say, yeah. but it's one of those things you should be aware of. As an entrepreneur, you should be exploring it. You should be thinking about, even if you have a company today that's centralized, how you could potentially structure things differently so that your employees and the community that you're involved in that is actually your customer, how they could also be an owner in some way through the mm -hmm. DACDAO model, because you will get more buy-in, more incentivized participation than any other centralized entity, I believe. Yeah. And, and that creates really incredible opportunity for exponential growth. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I mean, some other data points on that, given the crowdfunding we've done, we've crowdfunded our companies, even through investment crowdfunding, we said no to VCs. And one of the reasons why is because we want to have a company formed by the people. If we didn't want to get ourselves in a position where we're, we have to make decisions to either please shareholders or customers, which don't always align, like yeah. that's the worst thing. It slows things down. It makes someone mad mm -hmm. <laughs> no matter what and increases your chance for failure. So we aligned it. We allowed you. You could invest in our company for less than our product cost. <laughs> so, so we were able to cross pollinate and have our customers be our investors and vice versa. And in the end, and even after selling the company and whatnot, looking back, like the most important part is the community. Yeah. It's not all the technology. Yes, I love blockchain. I love other technologies like AI, whatever. Technology is great. But as you said, if you don't have trustworthy people, if you don't have community, all that doesn't matter. I mean, that's why we do this. We we have a community of uncommon entrepreneurs. <laughs> we have all this stuff. And and that and the value always in the end comes to the people, which the belief obviously extends from. And when you you just use the technology to enhance that and to guide that, um, I kind of think about it as uniting human belief mm -hmm. through technology. And that might be, it could be in a, a, a monetary sense, or it could be in a company, or it could be in in an initiative to go clean up beaches or, or whatever it is, but you utilize technology just to help us better, I guess, allocate our, our belief or our caring for stuff, whatever that is. And I think another interesting point is this is going to expedite a product market fit to know if you really have something, because if you go with needing a community to get behind it, you're going to know if you have a product or not mm -hmm. right away versus there could be a lot more excitement and then it could be easier to raise capital because you already have that idea as well as you're saying it's just crowdfunding to the max type of concept where you're like your your crowd is helping you fund this because you can put many investments in it sounds like right now and i'm curious to hear you luke and brian your thoughts with like where the where the security world's at that seems like that's like the glass ceiling right now kind of preventing some of this or maybe you're seeing seeing it from a different vantage point. You mean like the SEC yeah. and these different regulations? Absolutely, there's a, a, a stifling uh, of innovation in some ways. And I think this is gonna create incredible opportunities, like I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, potentially for Puerto Rico and other jurisdictions that are willing to take a risk. You know, we're seeing some interesting things in Barbados. We're seeing some interesting things in the Caribbean. Um, there are a lot of different jurisdictions that are realizing like, wait a minute, if I go out and be the, on the forefront of this, mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm just just in the news recently, you know, fifty million dollars added to one of the large companies, you know, balance sheets. What's the first government that's going to do that? Buying up Bitcoin, you know, and and I know there are governments doing this yeah. on the sly, just like they're buying gold in in, in ways that they don't publicize. But I, I imagine that once they get vested in this ecosystem, they're going to be probably much greater participants, mm -hmm. and they're going to mm -hmm. enable this and realize it because it's almost like saying, well. Gold is the standard for you know the global economy, but we're not going to allow gold mining in our nation. It's like, well, that was just suicide. <laughs> you know, that's financial suicide. And I think some of the regulators are starting to realize this. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there's some sandbox type ideas where they're saying, hey, we'll let you innovate within these guidelines mm -hmm. with this blockchain technology. Um, that said, you know, you've got to follow the law. You know, yeah. a lot of people think that they've you know, got a token and and that it's not a security, but if you follow the Howey test and other things, it's like, well, it's pretty clearly a security. So yep. we that's why with FIO, we work with Fenwick and West, so a fantastic uh, law firm in the United States, uh, Travis Thorpe in, in the Cayman Islands. And so we're, we're, we've done things very, very well uh, on that regard because it is a concern. You know, there are a lot of scams, uh, mm -hmm. just like in the early internet days, a lot of scams. And so we have to be really careful to protect the consumer, make things easy for them, and also, uh, you know, make sure they get educated to be able to take on the personal responsibility required 
to be self-sovereign. That's another big challenge is a lot mm-hmm. of people don't want ownership of this. They actually yeah. want what they're used to, which mm-hmm. is a centralized entity that if they lose their password, they can do a password yep. reset and they get their password back. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's not available in blockchain. You really yeah. are your own bank. You really are in sovereign control of your funds. And it takes an evolution of consciousness for people to be prepared for that. And mm-hmm. yet, for those who can make the jump, I mean, I, I bought my house in Nashville, Tennessee, using Bitcoin in a large way. Those who can make that jump, uh, it's phenomenally lucrative, I would say. Uh, it's not financial advice, but I'm just saying, this: if you're able to get into the future of something prior to everyone else, then you have that advantage, obviously. And exponential technology. Exactly. Yep. yep. So, I, and so part of it's education. Part of it, a big part of it, and this is why I'm focusing full-time my attention right now on FIO, is making it easier. Got it. This technology is entirely too complex for the everyday user. And so there's a certain number of things that we believe with the foundation is, you know, will this reach mass adoption? I think it's inevitable. It's the best ledger ever invented. Money's always been a ledger. It's the best form of money ever invented. Will it only be one blockchain? Some Bitcoin maximalists believe it's just going to be Bitcoin with second layer solutions like Lightning and others. Maybe that's true. And they cite Gresham's Law and other different you know, justifications for that. But I also look at competing currencies and historically how those have done. And I think that it's very probable we won't have the 5,000 to 10,000 tokens we have today, sure. you know, or hundreds and hundreds, but we'll probably have dozens of actual valuable tokens and technologies that are focusing on different aspects of human interaction and human value. So I think you're going to have dozens of cryptocurrencies that are mass adopted. So then what's the hindrance to that? I think it's usability. We need a solution that can make all those different blockchains and technologies and tokens and all this confusion make it make sense. And so the next question is, okay, if it's inevitable, it's going to happen. So someone has to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. Who's going to solve it and how are they going to solve it? They can either solve it in a centralized way, which is kind of traditionally how things get done. And that's generally where governments step in and you get the guys with guns, you know, who get to be violent and control things. I'm hoping we don't go that direction. I'd like to solve it in a decentralized, secure, self-sovereign and private and secure way. Um, that is what we've look to do with FIO. And we do that through three major features. You have FIO addresses, which is a human readable address like Luke at Stokes. And I can attach any crypto address I want, Bitcoin, EOS, Ethereum, doesn't matter. Any cryptocurrency will work in a FIO enabled product, just sending or receiving from that address. And receiving is the other great feature where I can request, you know, if we were gonna get lunch here, we could split the bill and say, hey, I'm gonna send a FIO request to you for USDT or Ethereum or whatever it might be. And you show, that shows up in your wallet. It comes from Lucat Stokes. You can verify that it's me. You can see exactly memo data. That's the third feature, FIO data, about what it was for and the exact amount. And you can just approve that request and then your wallet will sign a transaction to send me crypto. And we never have to see a big, long, crazy Bitcoin address. Mm-hmm. We never have to deal with what's called a man in the middle attack. Where I'm like, hey, I want to send you funds, and you're like, oh, okay, cool, and you 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 text me your your uh, your Bitcoin address, but then you didn't know I, you know, somebody got SIM swapped, and it's somebody else's Bitcoin address. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm buying a house from you, and I send you the crypto, and you're like, hey, let's close on this house, and you're like, I already sent the crypto. Well, I never got it. Oh no, I sent it to the wrong Bitcoin address. And it's irreversible <laughs> transactions. You know, they that can't be undone. So a fee request makes that not a concern. And when you're passing along in cryptocurrency spaces and really cryptography in general public keys, it's a very sacred event in cryptocurrency and, and, and cryptography circles. It's, they actually have what they call key signing parties, where you could take a public key and know that Luke Stokes is the only person that has the corresponding private key to be able to you know, verify that only yeah. I can control that. And this makes that much easier. So yeah. we can say, hey, you can go, my Twitter account says Luke at Stokes. I'm saying it here on the video, you know, Luke at Stokes. Anyone could verify I'm Luke at Stokes. And then any cryptocurrency address attached to that, only I have permission to make that attachment or send fee requests from that address because I control the private key for that address. And therefore, you know, you can trust that it came from me. And that's a really powerful thing that we don't have in this space uh, without fee. Yeah. So um, what I'm hearing you say, it's like a similar functionality to like almost what PayPal uses. Exactly. That's an ancient technology in comparison to what you're saying is going to change. But they, like the... Amazon doesn't know my credit card number if I use PayPal. Is that kind of the same concept or? Yes. Uh, like it, Venmo, I guess. Yes, you have Venmo the, too. Exactly, like Venmo. And those, PayPal, Venmo are great examples of you know, centralized solutions to provide more 
autonomy and freedom and, and uh, you know letting people engage with their crypto or their you know their finances eventually crypto you know I, I was mm -hmm. you know six months back or so that PayPal made some announcements that were interesting but I think a lot of these companies are going to be moving more and more to adding cryptocurrency as part of the process and service offerings that they offer and they're going to need something that people are used to just like PayPal Venmo these type yep. of systems WeChat you know in Asia they're going to need systems that they're familiar and right now, cryptocurrency is not that. It's too complicated, mm -hmm. too confusing. You're checking all these characters, and you're not sure is it going to go to the right person. Then you send it off. It's not in your wallet, but you don't see it on a block explorer. And you're like, I want to get information about this transfer. I want like a memo so I can even know mm -hmm. what it's for. And that's just not ubiquitous across all the different yeah, blockchains. Or they're in silos. And this is common for any technology, not just blockchain. But it's like, oh, well, if you don't use Venmo or if you don't use PayPal, mm -hmm. like, then I can't send something to you. And, and you ha then have to first, before I can send this money to you, and I have this a lot because I refer a lot of blockchain apps to people and, and whatever, but it's like, oh, well, before we can do this really cool thing, download this, get set up. Oh, there's another cool thing, but it's a totally different app. Download this, yeah. set up this. And one thing I do actually like about Fio is it can attach to all your different, I guess, wallets mm -hmm. of different types of blockchains or cryptocurrencies and it could be kind of like, obviously, as it gets adopted more, more of a not centralized but single yes, <laughs> um, yeah. um, access point or, or whatever. I just have to remember Lucas Stokes. Yeah. Remember Brian at Edge yeah. or whatever. And that's, that's pretty simple. It's because you can software. switch out the underlying exactly. Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever. And they, the, all of those, um, like, it, FIO doesn't actually talk to any individual blockchain. We call it like a usability layer on top of that. Mm. done at the wallet layer, at the it. wallet level. So if I'm interacting with an application and there's a wallet there, it's at that layer that you'd be able to say, okay, uh, I want to send Bitcoin, or I want to send Ethereum, or whatever that wallet supports, Feel immediately supports all of those chains and tokens mm. because it's at that wallet layer leading up to that transaction. So you're saying, okay, uh, I, I want to request some payments. You know, you get that feel request and it comes in and you say, okay, it's for this amount of token, this detail, and you approve it. At that moment, it goes into your wallet's normal send functionality. So it's going to send the normal cryptocurrency. It's going to encrypt that message with your private key just mm -hmm. like normal and send it out just like normal. And FIO didn't actually have to talk to that underlying blockchain for that transaction to take place. Mm -hmm. It just was leading up to that as a user experience. Which, in that case, doesn't add to like gas fees or, or fees, correct? So if you're using it, or does it add it doesn't, to how um, much it costs to send a transaction? Yeah, the native fees target? on each chain, it's a really good question. Those are still the way they are. You know, we, we don't make Ethereum cheaper, you know, yeah. uh, but as far as how we deal with that on the particular FIO chain, this is another important concept in, in blockchain technology is that nothing can be free on a blockchain. If you're ever looking at a system where they claim it's free, yeah, it's probably decentralized and not free because these systems, if something's free, it becomes an attack vector. I could just, you know, do a whole bunch of yeah. stuff and bloat the blockchain and become too big and unusable. Mm -hmm. And the way we've dealt with that with FIO is that when you register a FIO address, there's like an annual fee. It's about $2 a year is the current price, and that's set by a decentralized group of block producers, those fees. And they get about 85% of those because they're securing the network. 10% mm -hmm. goes to the wallet provider that provided that service to you. And then 5% goes back to the foundation, the nonprofit entity, to continue developing the protocol, do marketing, advertising, promotions, things of that nature. So when, when you pay that fee to register that FIO address, you get what we call bundled transactions. So you get a, a hundred bundled transactions currently, and those are basically used for your future interactions with the blockchain. So you register your address, mm -hmm. and then you want to map you know, your Bitcoin address to that, look at Stokes, you want to send some field requests out, you want to reject some field requests, mm. you want to approve field requests. That's all manipulating data on the ledger. Mm. But for most users, you know, I mean, you're probably a power user, you probably do more than 100 interactions on the blockchain in a given year, but most people probably don't. Sure. The idea would be, you know, couple times a month they're interacting with their blockchain and they're using field requests and field send and they're not even going to notice you know any type of loss aversion at all with having mm -hmm. to pay a fee to interact with the chain now if you get beyond that you know and you're a high user let's say you're amazon and you're going to be busting out thousands and thousands and tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of field requests every day to do your e-commerce well then you're going to have to actually own the token to be able to have uh, the, the ability to pay those fees on chain uh, to, to secure that so that's part of the mm -hmm. kind of tokenomics model but for everyday users and also too like I don't pay for my Gmail account. There's yep. still resources being spent on me to have a Gmail account, yep. but the company that hosts that website mm -hmm. pays on my behalf. And we're probably going to see that quite a bit as well, where applications that see the benefit of FIO 
or go ahead and say, okay, we're going to cover this cost on chain on behalf of our user because it makes our whole product offering accessible to the masses. Yep. And then on top of that too, it's also one of those, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing that we suffer from the network, the network effect problem, meaning the value of our system today exponentially mm -hmm. increases as more people use it, but we're also limited by that. Yep. If we don't have more people yep. using it today, it's less valuable. So yep. we're exploring ways that we can incentivize not only the block producers, not only the wallet integration providers, but also the end users, the people who buy FIO addresses, FIO domains, and actually send and receive crypto using FIO. We've got some really cool ideas to make it a co-op model where mm -hmm. those who are participating today might be able to share and uh, participate in a share of the revenue in the future at a mm -hmm. higher rate because they took a risk and yeah. got involved early. Uh, and that might include as, as well the token holders, but these are things we're just kind of exploring. What's fun is, you know, the foundation doesn't get to make these decisions. You know, we're not a centrally controlling entity. We're just out there serving the, the community-led blockchain and we can provide ideas, we can write code, we can submit proposals, but ultimately the, the decentralized block producers from around the world uh, control the protocol and make decisions on it. So it's, it's mm -hmm. a pretty neat model. You're, you're living yeah. out your belief or yeah. what you were describing earlier. Absolutely. You're making it a reality. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So what would you say are maybe some, some parting thoughts for the Uncommon Entrepreneur community that you kind of want to leave with to, to have people come away with? I, I would say for one, uh, please look into blockchain technology. Like just spend an afternoon, a weekend, learn about Bitcoin, learn about the early ones, learn about Ethereum, you know, learn about what these systems are and how they're disrupting the entire, not just financial industry, but even governance and organizations and how people build businesses. Learn about whether or not a DAC or a DAO, for example, is something you might be interested in because it's going to come quick and it's going to come fast. You know, yeah. we are, you, when you listen to people like Ray Kurzweil and others who talk about the singularity, talk about the, the rapid increasing pace of change, um, this is what he's talking about. It's these type of decentralized distributed technologies, everything from AI to 3D printing to cryptocurrency uh, and, and DACs and DAOs. So I would, I would encourage, you know, spend some time learning about it. And then from there, you reach out, connect to your community. You know, if, if there's not a group in your area, just like I did in 2013, start one. You know, find out and say, hey, let's do a Bitcoin meetup or let's do a blockchain cryptocurrency meetup. Let's do a meetup on DAX and DAOs. And you don't have to be the expert. Yeah. If you spend a weekend watching some explainer videos, you know more than most people, <laughs> probably more than some reporters. And, and you can bring, again, back to what we said earlier, the real value together, which is the community. And... Um, and, and reach out to people on Twitter, reach out to people on Telegram. There's so many people that are happy to help and, uh, and bring people along on, on, with this emerging technology and help people understand what's going on. But man, it's just so much easier to understand today than it was in 2013. So many more resources available to you. So my encouragement would be, you know, level up, do the work, it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. This is the future. And if you get to have just that little bit of edge over your competitors, and that little bit of edge to engage your community at a higher level, your customers, your vendors, your employees, you know, everyone that's touching your product or service, uh, it's really could be hugely beneficial for you. Uh, yeah, I think that's critical. Do you have any like specific people you follow or you maybe that create YouTube or on oh, different wow. platforms? You know, it's funny. It's like I used to have all of these people that I, you know, yeah. like Andreas Antonopoulos, for example, yeah. who comes to mind. He's been phenomenal. I, you know, we used to tweet back and forth in 2013. Um, there's so many. Uh, I could list out a, a, a quite a few. Um, you know, Girl Garden Crypto, Crypto Tips with Heidi. Uh, I mean, there, there's there's quite a few that I follow and that I've been able to do interviews with and stuff. But it's funny. I've been so busy building lately yeah. that I haven't. I don't get as much time to kind of like listen to podcasts and stuff. I but but yeah. I mean, you can. You, I would literally just say, you know, Google top crypto podcast yeah. and you'll get overwhelmed with so much yeah. great content. There's. It's really exciting to see how more how many people are out there. It's pretty that. accessible. Yeah. Yeah, it's more yeah. of the desire that's needed. That's exactly. the difference. Exactly. And it yeah. can be overwhelming because it is highly technical and people can jump in and be like, wait, this isn't my crowd. These people are talking, you know, yeah. ZK snarks and multi-sig. And you know, they're just like, what? I'm just, no, it's too complicated. And so we're trying to help with that, with field, make yeah. it easier. But at the same time, uh, you know, dive in as much as you can on that because some of that stuff is going to be important to understand, even at, a, at an entrepreneurial level, at a C yeah. level. You know, understand just the basics of what's going on here. Uh, it's just like internet. You know, you had to level up and learn email eventually. Yeah. Yeah, and just find someone within your circle who knows more than you about it. Um, a lot of people, like most people have that 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 son or nephew or, or daughter or whatever that's like the tech person in the family. Oh, fix this. My computer's not working or whatever. And there's probably an increasingly someone like that in blockchain, yeah. cryptocurrency. I happen to be the one for my family. Hey, 
what about this one? And I get surprised, but but they'll come and ask and like, oh, well, you should talk to this person or look at this person because there is so much out there that sometimes it's easier just to find someone who you trust who's yep. nerdier than you and you then and say, hey, them. this is what I'm looking for. And they'll be like, oh, go this direction. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about all this stuff. Definitely. Trust and reputation is hugely important and more so in this community because there are a lot of scams out there. Anything that looks too good to be true is, uh, you know, don't ever give anyone your private key <laughs> or password logins under any re any reasons. I mean, I've, I've done videos uh, years ago about how to help people understanding blockchainfreedom.com was a website I put together with some videos a while back, trying to help people understand how they could stay safe with this because it is the Wild West. It's a little crazy. But again, I do believe it's the future. And it's just like if you could have gotten your, your business to figure out online marketing before anyone else, you know, you would have had that much of an advantage. You know, those are the type of opportunities that exist in this space right now. Yeah, that's amazing. How do people find you? I can be found pretty much everywhere as Luke Stokes. So I'm on Twitter, at Luke Stokes, uh, Telegram, at Luke Stokes. Uh, most of the systems, I'm on Hive, at Luke Stokes. I'm um, also, I think, at uh, Voice, at Luke Stokes. So pretty much everything is at Luke Stokes. Uh, LukeStokes.info is the website that I have there uh, for consulting, which I'm not able to do <laughs> at the moment anymore. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much where you can find me. I'm probably most active on probably Facebook and Twitter at the moment. Nice. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, your wealth of knowledge. We'll probably have to do another one based yeah. on comments on what to go because we could talk for hours and we just hit the surface on. But I think you did a great job of keeping it simple. And but you know, it, you're it, this is an industry. You have to uh, if these terms are new, you have to dig in deep and because this is going to be in the vernacular very soon of how the world works and the financial opportunity on top of how it's just going to disrupt. But uh, you know, bring the world to more even playing field for those that aren't, you know, in the inner circles right now, I think is critical. So I appreciate you coming to join us. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's it for today, guys. <laughs> yeah. Tune in soon. Check another episode. Comment below. Like, subscribe. Let us know what you guys want to hear. All right. See ya.